Here we are in Judges chapter 10. So this is the 15th installment of our series in Judges um, entitled, we'll put this up here, God's Faithfulness in a Time of Despair. And the time of the Judges was really an unruly time. It was the Wild West of ancient Israel, a time when everybody is described as doing what was right in their own eyes, and it was a train wreck. We're going to be looking this morning at quite a few verses. We'll get to the first part of chapter 11 as well. And as we, as we begin looking at this, remember just kind of to set the stage, what we looked at last time was Abimelech. And Abimelech was uh, really a terrible leader in Israel, um, or at least that segment, that small section of towns of which he ruled for a time. And eventually the Lord brought back on his own head exactly what he had coming to him. So that, that did not go well. Um, so Abimelech was the son of Gideon. So we've seen several judges, one after another after another in this cycle of the judges. The cycle, you remember, it's um, the, the uh, nation of Israel. At this point, they're not really even a nation. They're kind of a, a fragmented uh, group of tribes. They're really not getting along that well. They're more or less functioning independently. And uh, it's, it's, chaos is continuing to uh, develop in Israel. Things are going from pretty good spot after Joshua led the people into the land, they, they got established, and then it starts this slow decline from there. And so the cycle of the judges, the people um, are walking with him, and then they turn away from him, they fall into sin, they cry out to him, God raises up a judge who delivers them, they're back to where they need to be walking with him, but then they repeat the cycle and it just goes over and over again, and it's just this downhill plummet that we witness in the book of Judges, and things go from bad to worse, and, and that's what's happening here is um, we, we've seen what happened with Abimelech, and he basically installed him through a murderous um, campaign as the, the local leader of this segment of Israel, and then now we're going to meet a couple more judges here that are just mentioned quickly. Um, so here we are, Judges, um, kind of gives you a little, uh, maybe a slight picture of what life was like at that time that we're looking at. Here we are in Judges chapter 10, verse 1, after Abimelech, there rose to save Israel Tola, the son of Puah, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar, and he dwelt in Shamir in the mountains of Ephraim. He judged Israel 23 years and he died and was buried in Shamir. So not a lot of information about this man Tola. Um, we're just told a little bit about his family, where he is from, and that he judged for 23 years. So what we can assume from this judgeship that God raised this man up is that this was probably a time of peace in Israel. There weren't uh, any significant problems. And... Um, his name, Tola, means worm, and he was of the tribe of Issachar, and he's the only judge whose father and grandfather's name is given. We also know just a little bit about him that he judged for 23 years, and uh, that he died and was buried in his hometown of Samir or Shamir. So not a lot, but we have this marker left down for us of his uh, time. And I think sometimes we'll, people will ask, well, why even include a judge in the book of Judges that reigned for, you know, we're just not given that much information about his time as a leader. And I think it's basically a historical marker. It lets us have a full picture of all the judges, of who they were. We get the complete record. And because there wasn't a major military campaign, um, not a lot of detail is gone into. So um, we don't really know much about him. In verse 3, another judge, and sometimes these judges are called the minor judges because we just don't have a lot of detail about them. Um, but verse 3, after him rose Jair, a Gileadite, and he judged Israel 22 years. Now, he had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys. 
they also had 30 towns, which are called Havoth Jair to this day, which are in the land of Gilead. And Jair died and was buried in Camon. So again, um, kind of a similar situation, maybe a little bit more detail about this judge Jair. Um, he, he judged Israel 22 years. Uh, we're told a little bit about his uh, place of origin, Gilead. So we'll talk about that more, but it's east of the Jordan River. And it says that he, um, he had 30 sons. So this tells us something right off the bat that he um, was polygamous. I mean, you don't, you don't have 30 children um, all with one wife. So he had multiple wives. Um, so probably someone who had means, who had some status. We also get that from the fact that they rode around on 30 donkeys. Well, you think, well, okay, why is that significant? What we observe throughout Scripture is that typically people didn't ride around on donkeys. Um, that would be associated more with royalty, with kings. They, they were maybe less common, and, um, and so this is kind of a, a status symbol. You know, this would be maybe something akin to like, uh, you know, driving a Ferrari or something like that, something very, very uncommon. Um, so they, they had this wealth and status and they also had 30 towns, and so this tells you that they, they had influence. They had towns of which each of them were associated in the land of Gilead. So they were kind of the movers, the shakers. They were important people in this region. But beyond that, we don't know much about his judgeship. We don't know what happened. Presumably it was a time of peace. He died and was buried there in Camon. Now this is where things get really interesting in, the, in chapter 10 here. Um, and we're going to spend some time on this, and it's, cha it's chapter 10, verse 6, where we read this. Then the children of Israel, again, did evil in the sight of the Lord. So presumably things had gone fairly well spiritually during the time of these other two judges, which covered a span of 55 years. And it says, then they did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtoreths, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the people of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines, and they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. So this is significant because we're told specifically about Israel's sin that they served the Baals and the Ashtoreth. So... Um, this reference here to serving the Baals and the Ashtoreths is an interesting one. I, I did a little bit of study into this, and it may be essentially a way of speaking about foreign pagan gods and goddesses generally. That um, then we, we get so kind of this overview, they, they serve these foreign gods and goddesses, and then here's Bing, 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 filling in the details. The gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the people of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines. So what we know about the, um, the wording here, we, we know Baal. Baal worship was a constant problem presented throughout the Old Testament that the people of Israel got sidetracked and struggled with. Um, the, the word there, Ashtaroth, is probably a um, Hebraism, a, a Hebrew rendering of the Canaanite god Astarte, goddess Astarte. So um, that's where you get that word Ashtar um, Ashtaroth. Ashtaroth is plural, Ashtaroths, um, and so it would be multiple goddesses at this point. Um, what we know from some other aspects of um, Ugaritic texts is the relationship between Baal and his women, let's just say that. Um, he was always thought to have these various female consorts, and that kind of formed the basis of their religion. It was, um, it was very uh, different from the nation of Israel and the one true God and that God isn't married with a, a wife and a harem somewhere. Uh, he's one. He's singular. The Lord our God is, is one God. And so the Canaanite religion, um, we know, became very influential throughout the region. That 
each of the cultures from Egypt to these ones mentioned here in, in Syria and Sidon and Moab and Ammon, they, they took the, this uh, general Canaanite worship idea, the, the gods and goddesses, the Baals and the Ashtoreths, and they kind of uh, made them their own. So, you know, in the same way that maybe in, here in America we will take uh, foreign cuisine, right, and we will very much make it our own uh, to where it sometimes doesn't necessarily resemble the original version of itself. And so that's what we have with these gods and goddesses as they were exported to Egypt and to Ammon and these different places is they took on different nuances according to that particular nation. Um, we also have a little bit of information about um, the, the, the goddess uh, Ashtaroth that in Deuteronomy uh, 7, 28, chapter 7 and chapter 28, there's a reference to Ashtaroth being uh, uh, connected with the young of the flock and the offspring of the cattle. And so what we have is um, some information about kind of what this was all about. The, the, ba- the system of Baal worship and Baal and the Ashtoreths was this um, idea of the, the things that were important in their society. This was an agricultural society. They, they raised crops, they raised animals, and they looked to Ashtoreth as the the one who was basically in charge of overseeing this process and keeping it going well, responsible for the fertility of their flocks. Um, some additional information as well is, um, and, we, and we can put this, this quote up here, um, basically Baal worship, when you get right down to it, was an explanation. It explained fertility, why people, cattle, and seed would reproduce, whether it be animals or crops. So when we look at, um, when we look at Baal worship, and I think maybe oh, this is a lot of times one of those things we read in the Old Testament, and we think, I, I wish I knew a little bit more. I wish I had a little more information about that. Well, let's, let's dive in a little bit here this morning. Um, basically, Baal worship, remember there's nothing new under the sun. And so the enemy of God, Satan, is constantly looking to um, make inroads into, to thwart the plan of God, to get people sidetracked, to get them confused and um, deceived. And so Baal worship, the thing, you, you might read in the Old Testament that they, they went after Baal worship and they forsook the Lord their God. You think, well, why? Why would they do that? Um, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't really make sense. It, so it must have had some kind of really um, appeal to it. And what Baal worship was, was it was basically a completely naturalistic explanation for everything in God's creation. So we think, gee, do we see that in our day where uh, the experts will tell us how everything works, um, setting themselves up as the ones who can make the determinations of what should and shouldn't happen based on their expertise. And that's, that's basically what you had with Baal worship, is it, it provided a naturalistic explanation for everything. And then going along with that, that's kind of the first component. The second component is it guaranteed results that would come from doing X, Y, or Z. They would instruct what needed to be done in order to please or appease these certain gods um, and then that there would be these certain benefits that would come from um, working within, fitting within this particular system. So it was an idea of you could manipulate the gods to give you the results that you desired, and they were guaranteed that you would get these results. And then, of course, if that result doesn't happen, you know, it's just, oh, we'll, we'll just recalculate the formula. We must have got something wrong in there somewhere and, um, you know, tweak it a little bit, and then people just continue on believing it. And the third component is the allure of the satisfaction of fitting in with all the other nations around them. 
the peer pressure or the fear of not wanting to be considered weird or different. So all the other nations were practicing their worship in this particular way, going after this model of, you know, the Baals and Ashtoreths, the gods and goddesses of their particular nations. And so if the people of Israel were doing something very different, they would stand out. They would be considered backwards and weird and something was wrong with them. So here we see, um, and I think we can put this up here. Um, I'm going to put up a, a quote here. Baal worship, this comes from this book, The Baal Conspiracy. Baal worship told farmers how to maximize success as planters and breeders of livestock. Baal also offered the key to success in everyday life. So that was the sales pitch. Is here's how to get what you want. Here's how to manipulate the gods to get what you want. Here's the key to success. We've got it all packaged up for you. You just, you know, do this particular course and you're good to go. Um, so here's our first takeaway this morning. Satan's objective is to provide a counterfeit worship system in order to subtly deceive even those who worship and serve the Lord. It appeals to our self-centeredness independence, and fear of becoming deficient intellectually or ostracized socially. So we must recognize that Satan manipulates by subtly conspiring to use many means to drive a wedge that will slowly separate us from worshiping God. His counterfeit system is designed to confuse, deceive, and manipulate us. It appeals to our own self-centeredness, selfish ambition, and also, of course, plays to our fear. So God's will for us is to recognize Satan's age-old tactics and recognize the underpinnings that appeal to, number one, selfishness, and number two, especially, fear. It's amazing how many things can be accomplished through the use of fear. So there's the appeal of this Baal worship, and it was why it was this constant struggle for God's people, because they didn't want to be uh, viewed as backwards. They didn't want to be left in the dust. They didn't want to be called intellectually deficient. Uh, they, they wanted to be able to have an objective system that they could buy into, and out of that, get what they wanted. They, they wanted success. They wanted the, the crops to do well and the herds to do well, and this gave them those promised results. Let's look at um, the next verses we have here. So the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the people of Ammon. So I don't know if we've got a map up here, but uh, Philistia along the coast of the Mediterranean, and then Ammon was on the eastern side. So if you basically took the land of Israel, which is kind of a skinny piece of land, all the, the enemies along the coast on this side and all the enemies east of the Jordan on this side, these were their two biggest uh, enemies by, by territory and by threat, and God uh, allows them to simultaneously now oppress the people of Israel. So this is the, the screws getting turned way up at this point. This is a huge problem. This is like, um, you know, if you think of our country with two coasts, the Atlantic and the Pacific, getting attacked on both coasts simultaneously. This is very bad. So um, verse 8, from that year, they harassed and oppressed the children of Israel for 18 years. All the children of Israel who were on the other side of the Jordan in the land of the Amorites in Gilead. Okay, so here's the map. Um, so basically this land over here is the land known as the land of Gilead. It, it's, it's hill country. Um, so here's Philistia along the coast over here, Philistines. Um, so you can see how if enemies are, are rising up here and enemies are rising up here, they're, they're being attacked from both sides at this point. Moreover, the people of Ammon crossed over the Jordan to fight against Judah also against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim so that Israel was severely distressed. So that's kind of an understatement. But basically, not only are the uh, Ammonites on the uh, attack, but they're even making excursions over here across the Jordan into the heartland of Israel. So what's going to happen? Let's look at verse 10 here. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. They're getting attacked from two sides at once. Um, 
they're not in a good spot by any means. And it says they, they finally uh, come to the realization that it's their own sin that's causing this. We have sinned against you because we have both forsaken our God and served the Baals. Um, so here we have the people understanding that their sinning against the Lord um, was why they've been oppressed by the Philistines and the Amorites for 18 years. So they finally cry out to the Lord for help. So the Lord said to the children of Israel, Did I not deliver you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites and from the people of Ammon and from the Philistines? And also from the Sidonians and the Amalekites and the Maonites oppressed you and you cried out to me and I delivered you from their hands. So he's reminding them of his faithfulness. He's reminding them of his power. He's reminding them of, their, of his deliverance of them time and time and time and time again with the obvious implication of, you know, are you, is your memory deficient? Why, you know, why are you not remembering all of these previous seven instances when he delivered them from their enemies. In each of the patterns, in each of the instances of these, the, the pattern was the same. The enemies oppressed, Israel cried out to God, and then God rescued them out of the hand of their enemies. So God's answer is basically in verse 13, let's look at this, yet you have forsaken me and served other gods, Therefore, I will deliver you no more. So God's answer is basically a, um, a, a threat like a, a parent would do. And it's more or less a conditional threat. It's going to depend on how they act this time around. Verse 14, um, God continues on by saying, go and, cr- so go and cry out to the gods which you have chosen. Let them deliver you in your time of distress. So what I love about this is God responds sarcastically, (laughs) right? And this is great because um, it's basically, you know, go, you've chased after those gods, go go cry out to them, which you've chosen, and let them deliver you out of your distress. So essentially, go right on ahead. Have fun with that. And so sometimes we... I think in our everyday life, in conversation, we use a lot of sarcasm. And maybe we get the idea that God is, you know, pious and lofty and must be somehow far removed or above all of that, and that the use of sarcasm is just something that we do that he doesn't do, yet we're made in his image. So why should it surprise us to see God use sarcasm and especially when the offense against him is outrageous and just completely warrants sarcasm specifically. So I think, you know, it's, it's helpful to think of God as using sarcasm, especially when it's fitting, in a way that we would be inclined to use sarcasm. Like, this is basically God saying, this is ridiculous. Let's look at verse 15. And the children of Israel said to the Lord, we have sinned. Um, do to us whatever seems best to you. They're saying, you know, we own up to it. We, we deserve what, what you give us. Only deliver us this day, we pray. So th- things are so bad that they come clean. They recognize that they have consequences coming to them, but still the situation warrants they're, they're just crying out to God to deliver them. So we see some, con- some contrition on Israel's part, and then we're about to see, let's look at verse 16, God's compassion. So they put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord. They got back on track spiritually. And his soul could no longer endure the misery of Israel. We see God's heart of compassion that yes, they, they're being oppressed. Yes, they've blown it time and time again. Yes, they've gotten messed up. Now they're at least, you know, getting back on track. They're at least doing the right things, um, humbling themselves and coming to him, crying out to him. And he recognizes that things as bad as they are um, can be met with his compassion and he is going to intervene on their behalf. So verse 17, the people of Ammon 
gathered together and encamped in Gilead, so that region on the east side of the Jordan River, which, as you go on from the Old Testament, it's known as Gilead. You go on into the Gospels, and it's regularly known as the region beyond the Jordan. And then in more modern times, maybe like the 19th century, the Transjordan, um, and now maybe in really recent times, the nation of Jordan, that's kind of this, this region that we're talking about as Gilead. And so the, the people of Ammon gathered together and encamped in Gilead, and the children of Israel assembled together and encamped at, in uh, Mitzpah. Uh, so here's where we're looking. So this is the, the Gilead region. Uh, three tribes, as you can see, or at least parts of those tribes, had settled um, the tribe of Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh, the other half's over here, um, had basically settled, um, instead of crossing over into the, the promised land, they, they thought, well, this, this hill country is pretty nice. Uh, we'd like to settle here, and it was nice land. The problem is... Uh, Ammon, you know, you have, you have Edom, you have Moab, you have Ammon, all these enemies right there on their doorstep, and so they're, they're on the front lines of their enemies by being across the Jordan. So um, here we have this invasion, uh, verse 18, and the people, the leaders of Gilead, said to one another, what are we going to do? Who's the man who will begin to fight against the people of Ammon? He shall be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. We need a leader. We need a commander. We need somebody to step in who's going to be able to go to battle against the Ammonites. So the people of Gilead, in, in light of this invasion, um, so I should just pause there for a quick second. When we put this map back up here, again, the uh, Philistia is rising up on the west and the Ammonites are rising up on the east. So as we go on in the book of Judges, God's going to use Samson to fight against the Philistines, and then as we uh, continue on this morning, we're going to see Jephthah as the one coming to fight against the Ammonites in the east. Um, so the, here we have this, um, the people of Gilead searching for a warrior who is going to deal with the Midianite military incursion into this into their land. Um, I think it's, uh, from, from what I'm gathering by the way that we're getting these references to Gilead, it seems that probably these three tribes are kind of banding together, working together, and that's who's in view by way of those living in Gilead at this point. It seems also at this point in time that in Israel, during this time of the Judges, that the government of Israel was not central, right? There wasn't Jerusalem. There wasn't a capital. There wasn't, uh, you know, a, a, a king and an administration and central government and a central military and things working smoothly together. This was really a breakdown where in Israel it seems like the local tribes had begun to function in their own local areas, more or less like the Canaanite city-states that we read about in, in terms of the Philistines and others. So the nation of Israel is not unified. And why that's significant is because um, if they had all been focusing on the Lord, they would be very unified. But at this point, they're fractured, and they're, they're not working together. They're just going it alone. It's, it's just kind of a, a mess in, in so many senses. Let's keep going here. In, so they're, they're searching for a leader. Let's see how this goes. Who, who is going to be the one who can take us into battle against the Ammonites now that they're having these military incursion into our land? Um, so chapter 11, verse 1. Now Jephthah, so um, this is basically a flashback. If you're watching a movie, you know, maybe you've been watching the movie up to this point, and then they're going to jump to a flashback where the main character, they're going to show you a little bit about his or her, um, you know, childhood, growing up years, and then they're going to jump you back into the action. So that's what these three verses are. These are our flashback to the growing up years of Jephthah to set the stage. Now, Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor, but he was the son of a harlot, and Gilead begat 
Jephthah. So Gilead was the, uh, he was either the grandson or the, the great-grandson of um, Manasseh. I think he was the grandson of Manasseh. Manasseh being one of the sons of Joseph. So I believe he was the great-grandson of Joseph. Um, and so this is a really prominent family within the tribe of Manasseh. And um, what we find here, though, about Jephthah is that he uh, was the son of this uh, woman who was a harlot, who was not his wife. And um, so we get a little bit about his background. Here's a little picture of Gilead, this hill country, this um, region across the Jordan. This is you know, what this looks like um, modern day. Give us a little picture about Gilead. So it's this mountainous region um, in the area of the Transjordan. And um, over here in this region, you have, this is the, the hometown. This is where this man Jephthah is, is from, to kind of give us a little picture of this here. Again, we have this flashback in the first three verses. Um, the, the time marker would be around 1090 B.C., and um, it says, when it says this um, introduction, now, now Jephthah the Gileadite, this is kind of cueing us into the idea that this is backing us up in time. So taking a break from the crisis of the moment, we're going to get some information here about Jephthah. Verse 2, um, Jephthah's wife bore, or sorry, Gilead's wife bore sons, and when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, you shall have no inheritance in our father's house, you, for you are the son of another woman. So this is Jephthah's expulsion. Um, he grows up, and the brothers want to make sure that the, the wealth, they're presumably from a wealthy, prominent family, um, they want to make sure that Jephthah has no part in that, and so they, they, they drive him out, and they presumably even threaten him with, with physical harm as well. Um, then Jephthah fled from his brothers and dwelt in the land of Tob. Uh, Tob means good in Hebrew. And worthless men banded together with Jephthah and went out raiding with him. Um, so here's to kind of give us our um, references. We have a reference to... Um, at the, in verse 17, chapter 10, verse 17, Mitzpah. Mitzpah is about right where this word Gad is right here, is, is the town of Mitzpah. So that's where they're, they're gathering, which does seem like a very central spot east of the Jordan. And then this uh, town called Tob is about over here, kind of northeast of Ramoth Gilead. It's way out there. He's off in the boonies in this place called Tob. So he has had to flee far away. He's He's gone off into exile, and that's where we're about to find him out having been expelled from uh, the family. Okay, so here's something for us as well. That another one of Satan's tricks has to do with the breakdown of the family. And so here now we're, we're seeing what this results in. We're, we're seeing the inherent, the inherent results of polygamy and, and adultery coming into focus here. This infighting and hatred and distrust and jealousy and even threats of violence among siblings and half-siblings, it's getting bad really quickly. Satan knows that strong families Adhering to God's design for marriage and family centered on the worship of God, prioritizing worship of him and cultivating personal relationships with Jesus Christ are exponentially more hostile to his agenda. So God's will for us is that we prioritize, model, and teach God's design for marriage and family. God's design is this. He created husbands and wives to be a team who will love each other, work together for the best interest of their family, support, uplift, and advocate for each other. Um, Holly has a saying, she's like, um, be each other's cheerleaders. And I, I think that's a really good perspective as a former cheerleader, a uh, good way of, of looking at it. 
um, to be there to advocate for each other, their children, and the divinely created institution of marriage, the enemy is so desperate to dissolve. So we're going to constantly see throughout all of history, including in our own day, not only just in the time of the judges, but in our own day as well, that the family is going to constantly be under attack. Um, whether it's, you know, getting uh, marriages. Um, I love, one of the, the ministries that I, I definitely really love is the ministry of Focus on the Family. I don't know if some of you guys listen to their programming on the radio, but it's fantastic. Um, you know, sometimes I'll be driving, and I've got to be in the right spot at the right time of the evening to catch those programs, and usually OMAC or, or Wenatchee when those programs come on. Um, but some just great tools for um, marriage and for parenting um, that are so, so helpful. And that really is just such a vital component of God's agenda. That's where the strength comes from for individuals, families, churches, communities, societies. God can do so much with strong families that Satan is constantly eager to do damage there. Okay, let's return from Jephthah's very um, dysfunctional upbringing and family chaos to now what this is moving into. Verse 4, it came to pass after a time that the people of Ammon made war against Israel. Um, so now, uh, so it came to pass after a time. So we're, we're, we're through with that backstory, and now we're right back to where we were with the current time and, and scenario. It came to pass the people of Ammon made war against Israel. Um, so the Ammonites have launched a military offensive into Israelite territory. Verse 5, And so it was, when the people of Ammon made war against Israel, that the elders of Gilead... And presumably they had been on board with Jephthah's expulsion into exile, um, went now, of all things, to get Jephthah, to summon him from the far-off place, the land of Tob. Um, and so these presumably are the elders, of, which would have included Gad, Reuben, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, to go get Jephthah out of exile. And verse 6, Then they said to Jephthah, you can just see them begging, come be our commander that we may fight against the people of Ammon. So he's got this reputation as being a strong warrior. And so they go to get him. He's, he's the right man for the fight. And so they go to, to summon him that he can step in as their general. So how's he going to respond to this? This is curious. Let's, let's see this in verse 7. So Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, Take a hike, <laughs> basically. Now, did you not hate me and expel me from my father's house? Why have you come now when you're in distress? Oh, I see how it is. You're going to kick me to the curb. You're going to get rid of me. And as soon as things go south, now you're going to come and uh, you know, try to get my help to face the crisis when you're in distress. So it's kind of this, wow, you know, you, you drive me away into exile, and then all of a sudden you're in trouble, you come begging me to be your military commander. Wow, just wow. He's, he's not impressed. Verse 8, And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, Well, that's why we've turned again to you now, that you may go with us and fight against the people of Ammon and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. So they, now their response is to sweeten the pot. They sweeten the pot by telling Jephthah that if he'll, if he'll come be their military commander, he can also not only be that, but he can be their political leader. So he can be their commander-in-chief, both militarily and politically, and rule over all the tribes of the east side of the Jordan, the land of Gilead. So this is sounding a little better. And Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, Okay. If you take me back home to fight against the people of Ammon, and the Lord delivers them to me, how can I count on that? How can I count on the, your promise to make me your, your leader, your political ruler? So at this point, Jephthah doesn't trust the promise. He sees it as something they're just making out of desperation. 
and that they aren't really going to follow through with that. But he likes the idea. He just wants more of a firm commitment from them at this point. So verse 10, the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, the Lord will be a witness between us if we do not do according to your words. So the elders make a promise that as God is their witness, they will make good on this promise. Um, So now at this point when they invoke the Lord, it becomes concrete. It is set set in stone at this point for better or for worse. Um, They're going to have Jephthah as their military commander, which is good, but they're also going to have him as their political ruler, which we're about to see could be good, could be bad, could be both. Verse 11, um, Then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and commander over them, we would probably say commander-in-chief over them, and Jephthah spoke all his words before the Lord in Mitzvah. So um, Jephthah, verse 11, basically repeats the terms of the agreement before the Lord in Mitzvah, indicating that he makes this kind of de facto covenant, as it were, that he enters into at this point. So it becomes very set in stone, very established, very binding. This brings us to our final takeaway this morning, and it is this. We have here a warrior with skill in armed conflict, but such a person may not have the prerequisite skills to serve as an efficient or effective political leader. A civil leader must elevate God's priorities. He or she must prioritize servant leadership in their role as a civil leader, one whose selfish ambition causes him or her to lead because they seek to be served, um, and that, um, on the other hand, one whose selfish ambition causes him or her to lead because they seek to be served could easily end up then sacrificing those they love and serve due to their arrogance and or bad judgment. So um, this is where uh, leadership is really important on a variety of levels. So uh, on one level, obviously for maybe a a population such as ours, we live in a democracy. So we have an opportunity to vote on our leaders, which is not the case everywhere in the world. Um, So hopefully we will take this to heart and look for people who um, are leaders who elevate God's priorities, who Um, show themselves to be leading, hopefully, for uh, either good reasons or halfway decent reasons, they want to serve. They're not looking to just um, elevate themselves, to be served, to enrich themselves, to, um, you know, exercise their own power trip, whatever it is. Um, So so that's one level is, uh, you know, when it comes to voting in a democracy and and, um, probably our best approach is to try to meet candidates in person, get to know them, talk to them, um, find out what makes them tick, that sort of thing. Um, but also in, in churches, in organizations, in, there's all kinds of places where um, leaders become, need to be hired, selected, um, that the, the, the qualities of servant leadership and of, again, we kind of noted this last time as well, that the ideal leaders are going to elevate those they serve. Their, their goal is to improve the lives of those they lead, to pour into the people, to, um, to unleash people's creativity and talents and abilities, and to um, remove barriers that are going to keep people um, down and, and, and out and, and struggling, and um, it, it's really to improve the lives of those they lead by serving. So um, with that, um, that, that will be where we leave off for today, and we'll, we'll pick up again next time. And it's about to get interesting, <laughs> because Jephthah is, is quite the quite the figure in, uh, at this time, the time of the judges in Israel. Um, we'll conclude there this morning. And 
are in conclusion this morning, uh, we would be remiss if we didn't conclude with the most important thing. Really, the, the, the example we have in our Lord Jesus Christ, and he taught that the greatest of all is the greatest servant of all, and he modeled servant leadership. He came not to be served, even though he is the greatest. He is um, the heir to all of everything, um, the, the one who is entitled to everything, the one who absolutely should be served and worshipped, and he came as a servant. He humbled himself, came to this earth to fulfill a mission. You might think, well, what was that all about? Well, Jesus came to this earth on a rescue mission. We serve the God who saves, who delivers, who rescues. Well, would he do that for me? Why would he do that for me? How would he do that for me? He came to um, live on this earth he became a man. He was born as a baby. He came to this earth. He, he lived in the, in the course of his life. Um, he was constantly in tune with the will of his father. He was a servant. He came on a mission to serve and to, to rescue those who were lost. Who are those that are lost? You, you might think, well, maybe it's just some, you know, some random fool out there. No, it's all of us. We are all lost and hopeless and in need of a Savior and in need of God's great compassion. Like there in, in, in verses 16, 17, 18, we see the God who had compassion on his people who were suffering. And he had compassion on all of us, suffering and lost and broken. Why are we suffering and lost and broken? Because we're sinners. We're, we're inherently broken. We're, we're infected with what we call the sin virus. It entered the world and it spread through all of us and, and we're a mess. We're separated. We, we're off track. We're, um, as we noted in the, the start of the message, we're, those things that appeal to us, we're inherently um, self-interested, selfish, fearful, all those things. And it causes all kinds of problems in our lives. But Jesus came to die for sinners, to lay down his life to save us, to set us free from that. Right now, uh, you know, without Christ, we are helpless. We're just carried about by the waves of our sin natures and our whims, and it's a mess. But Jesus came to set us free from that so that we're not subject to our sin natures and tossed to and fro anymore, but we are set free from that, and we have a new nature. We have the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us when we become believers. We trust in Jesus Christ, the one who laid down his life. He sacrificed himself for us because he loves us. Greater love has no one than this than a man lay down his life for his friends. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. He has set us free. We're forgiven. We're given eternal life. We're given his Holy Spirit. We're given a new start, new nature. We're new creations in Christ made brand new for all who come. And trust in the one who died for you, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've never done that this morning, it's a decision only you can make, and I pray that each one will do that before leaving here this morning. Let's close in prayer. Father, we are so thankful for who you are, for your love for us, for the way in which you work in our lives. We ask, Lord, this morning that you would take this passage, you would take these lessons, the things that we have observed and that we would take them to heart, that we would see what your plan is for us, what your perspective is, um, what the enemy is doing and trying to drive a wedge and get us off base and off track and um, in ways that are subtle and that we may not even realize things that are creeping in. But Lord, we, Lord, Lord may we stay focused on you and what you're doing, your purposes, and our, your purposes in our lives and in our community, in our church, in our world. We ask, Lord, that you would use us as you transform us to go out and to be examples of people who are not perfect, people who are not uh, holy rollers. We're just people who have been set free and who you are transforming. Lord, I pray that that process of transformation would give us an opportunity to tell others our story what you have done in our lives and what you are doing, that's our story, that's our, our testimony. And that through that, Lord, I pray that you would use that in a mighty way, that we're simply 
one beggar telling other beggars where we found bread and that we found the bread of life and that you are the, the way, the truth, and the life and you are the only one who has the answers that we need. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for this time. We ask that you'd bless our time now of fellowship and snacks and business meeting to follow. We ask all this in Jesus' name.